Hello, everyone. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the people of the Kulin Nation on whose lands we're making this discussion today, and I pay my respects to their elders past and present. In particular, to Nawit Carolyn Briggs, who is Boonwang Elder and is part of the Faculty of Art, Design and Architecture. My name is Laura Harper. I'm a practicing architect in Melbourne and I'm a lecturer in architecture here at Monash. This discussion is part of the Form by Content series created by Monash University Museum of Art for the Faculty of Art, Design and Architecture. And today I'm very excited to be talking with Talon Hasbar. For those of you who are short-sighted, I'll give a brief description of myself. And after I've introduced Talon, she will do the same. I'm sitting in a sunny room in Melbourne with a bookcase and a painting behind me. I've got short dark hair and I'm wearing a stripy top. Talon Hasbar is based in the United Arab Emirates and holds a degree in architecture from the American University of Sharjah. Talon's work crosses architecture, design and art to connect with the surrounding landscapes and the intricate materiality of the natural world. Through her research-based study of architecture, Talon looks to redefine material experimentation to understand the context of landscapes, material properties and organic processes and test how these may sensitively and functionally be applied to creative practice. Talon has exhibited locally in the United Arab Emirates and internationally at fairs and institutions, including Design Days Dubai, Dubai Design Week, Nuva Abu Dhabi in 2018, and in 2020 at the NGV Trinali, where you may have seen her beautiful work accretions, which I think Talon is going to talk a bit about today. Thank you, Laura. Um, uh, thank you for the introduction, and I'm really pleased to be part of this series. Um, uh, I would like as well to uh, describe where I'm sitting right now. Um, uh, I'm in a room behind me, uh, curtains, they're like sound insulated, which is great. And uh, uh, I'm a dark, uh, I have a dark hair and, um, and short hair. Um, and um, I'm, I'm really kind of like very pleased to take you through uh, the work and the discussion and um, and to kind of like, discuss more the work and my practice. Well, um, I know you're going to share some slides with us today. Would you like to start that now? Yeah, definitely. Great. Uh, so just to kind of like um, my practice, just to kind of give an overall of like my work and uh, the way I kind of like define it or as, as I go, um, it's very driven by like materials and processes. and um, I usually like kind of look at it as, and I refer to those like kind of works as the structures of impermanence because time is a very uh, essential element in, in, in the work. Um, and uh, through my earlier practice, like in earlier work, I was kind of like more focused on defining the idea of molds and what does it mean to kind of like um, uh, create and mold and the idea of um, having like a fixed framework uh, and that's where I was kind of like started to kind of work with materials that uh, granular materials that we will be able to kind of like reshape and um, redefine the molds around them. And one of the materials um, that I, uh, I worked with uh, was um, sand. And uh, in these pictures, like this is where I started kind of working on uh, the mold using the same material to kind of allow for the contingency between the material and the, the mold it holds. Um, and this is kind of like basically one of the prototypes or one of the structures that I've been working um, with, the, with, the, with the molds itself, which is made from the same material. And this is where I feel like it was kind of an exciting process because it's kept on kind of like there is always kind of unexpected uh, results and moments in the process. And there's always kind of like uncertainty that happens. And it's kind of like embraced within the circumstances that is around the material or the textures and the, the other factors that are actually kind of like, um, kind of found within the process or within the time that I'm making the, the work. Um, these are other kind of like um, structures that were actually done also with the um, with using the mold which is done which is the, the same material the sand itself and then how the, the adhesive is kind of like kind of um, bounding the material together through different application of the adhesive on the um, on the material um, 
I would just run through it because they were kind of like uh, some kind of tests uh, with different structures. Um, and it depends on like the, the application of the adhesive on the material itself. It was kind of like creating really interesting kind of forms and structures. And this is what kind of like in the early stage where I find this very interesting because it kept on kind of giving a lot of uh, variety of structures, but then um, it's kind of like an experiment just to understand this relationship between the mold and uh, the outcome. And were you making the were you making them on on site? You showed some pictures of actual sand formation. So I wondered whether you were pouring them in the studio or or um, outside. Yeah, so the, the material, uh, basically like I was doing, I started doing them with a sandbox uh, in the studio and uh, then it started to kind of like, I really wanted to understand as well if I move um, to the landscape and to an open area, uh, desert, and then start casting it in on site, how would it react? And it was very interesting because in the studio, it was very controlled and the sand that I am also using was very like, it was sieved and it has like kind of one um, particular si size of grain. Uh, when I moved to the uh, to desert, then the whole kind of like there's other things that started to kind of be part of it, the humidity of the, the sand, um, uh, how much it absorbs like or how much it's actually close to a plant um, or how far it is from the road. So it was very interesting like to kind of notice as well those other elements that start to kind of like um, uh, show and you start to kind of like control and not control and kind of like understand while you're working on it. So it was very interesting because the first part was literally having it in a very kind of control environment. I know exactly the constraints, but still there is within that because the granular size would affect the way that it would interact with, with the forces that you are applying. But then the soon as it's shifted to, uh, to the landscape itself, there are like more factors that needs like that started to kind of like add to the kind of the unexpected uh, surprises while while working, uh, which was very exciting at that time. Um, and this is where actually like one of those like uh, this was done uh, closer to the beach, uh, where also like shells and fragments of other like animals started to also kind of like adhere to uh, to the structure itself. Um, and left different kind of crust thicknesses. And this is where I find it really interesting because it's more about like, there are other factors of the depth of the, the mold itself um, started to kind of like be part of the, the process. Um, and I find this is where like, it, like the idea of recreating a mold, it's, it's kind of like, for me, it, it started to kind of open up a lot of other, um, other ideas and other processes um, because we're losing that kind of very strict or very kind of defined mold and structure and we're allowing other kind of like factors to come in and uh, kind of work within that, the, the process itself. Um, yeah. Um, so these are like, I was also like very interested to kind of understand the, the fragility of those structures by adding as well a light element and the projection on top of those surfaces to understand like how fragile or how much like kind of layers got accumulated or got kind of like um, um, over one layer of like kind of the, the solidification process. And um, that's where like I started kind of like embedding some light um, lights within those surfaces. And it was very interesting to see also the density within the surface itself where it started to be like very fragile at some point and then but then it becomes like more like solid and more opaque as like the material gets like as the material gets deeper or more layers um, into the surface. So these are like literally kind of experimentation of like the, the structure itself and then how would like light be, um, be part of those structures in order to kind of like just understand um, the layers that got actually like um, created within this process. Um, and that actually like kind of like leads me to another project where I was kind of trying to also understand like how to integrate light with, with structures and all. Um, in, in another project where I worked um, on and it, it was called Lipic. And basically 
I was kind of using stones um, uh, to have routine and I wanted to kind of basically have a unit system where the piece would always be kind of restructured and um, uh, reconfigured again. Uh, and it was basically based on a storytelling uh, or a folk tale that was uh, was actually uh, famous in, and I mean, like it's it's one of the very famous folk tale in in Fujairah, which is one of the uh, the seven Emirates, and it's all about like the mountain structures and how how there were like there are like certain elements that they believe like in certain mountain there is like shards that come across and kind of like. Um, people start to kind of like react to them differently. And I was really interested to kind of transform, let, let's say this story or the folk tale into, a, into, an, into an object that people can actually experience as well. Uh, and this is where like the configuration of the storytelling and how it actually like kind of changed through time and how everyone kind of like start to tell the story differently. So the piece also like kind of interact and start to kind of reshape again, based on how do we tell the story again? Um, and this is where like, it's kind of like a modular system where those shards start to kind of like reconfigure once you kind of like change the position of those like uh, stri uh, stripes. Um, but it was like literally kind of an interesting moment because like, it's kind of like taking a very, a, a very kind of something that you hear of and uh, you kind of like retell or you heard it from different sources differently, but then how do we actually translate this kind of like um, form of uh, telling into something that is more uh, structured or experienced? Um, yeah. There is uh, also like another project that I worked on, which is um, a transient. And it's, it's, it was basically a, con uh, a collaboration between um, um, uh, between myself and another like factory in France. And uh, it was a ceramic uh, factory. And uh, we were actually kind of like really concerned on, um, uh, I mean, concentrated on like kind of uh, creating, um, okay, uh, like basically what, what I was kind of aiming to do uh, to kind of like work on uh, the archaeology sites that are in, in Sharjah uh, specifically. And uh, we were kind of trying to understand like the time element that is around archaeology sites. And this is where like what kind of preserve the, the other and what uh, what materials tell time better. Is it the ceramic or is it the sand that preserves the ceramics within the within the surface? And how much when we're like when the archaeologists do the digging and uh, those processes how much they actually ruin the site versus how much um, it kind of like start to appear or start to kind of like uh, show more of the not like, let's say the, the time frame that the site went through. Uh, and this is where like, um, basically I was kind of going to site and kind of experimenting with the materials that are found locally on like on the restoration sites in those archeology span spaces um, and uh, starting to kind of like test um, some kind of like prototypes on um, what the material around that site is and um, questioning the idea of like which element preserve and which element is the host and kind of like the, the visitor material. And this is where like the collaboration between, um, between the factory and, um, and, this, and like myself and the UAE where we try to kind of like um, find a way of kind of working on basically uh, sand and how does it actually work when it is used in the ceramic um, uh, as a glaze or as a, uh, as a material integrated within the ceramic making and then the other way around when we're getting those ceramic pieces and fragmentation and how do we preserve, it, preserve, preserve them uh, in the local grounds. Um, and this is where like it was an installation and this is where it was in Rub Abu Dhabi. Uh, we were kind of like trying to kind of integrate the two elements together where we're presenting the host and the visitor at the same time um, and where like the materials, both of the materials kind of like exist, but also kind of like exist in, um, in ex exist, but also like there's the challenges of like how the ceramic would actually um, be within uh, this kind of like um, 
cube of, of sand and how does it react over time uh, on those kind of like uh, configurations. But what was the process of making these? It almost looks like you've made them invisible and then undertook a kind of archaeological process yourself of digging them out in order to see the things inside. Yeah, I mean, like this, is, this was really uh, interesting because like we were literally kind of, um, I was trying to kind of like create the same kind of typology or bricks uh, that was done uh, during like the any restoration processes. So I was kind of like trying to um, to have like a couple of like uh, trials and errors and how like to preserve these two together and still kind of exist without like changing the property of one. Um, uh, like for example, the sand kept on like also cracking as like, because the ceramic has a completely different, um, uh, like it's completely different integrity of the material itself. So it was very interesting to kind of like see how these would bond together. And this is where like, it was mainly about kind of trying to uh, to find the right way of creating a mold that will still kind of like preserve these two and uh, and trying different mixes in order to understand like what would be the kind of the matching or the best mix that would go along with the ceramic uh, and would still kind of maintain this um, this integrity of uh, the two materials coming together. Um, yeah. But uh, like I was literally kind of like re-questioning the idea of like how the how archaeologists kind of like redo uh, or like kind of do the restoration process and work along that because I find it very fascinating the way that every archaeologist has a completely different understanding or different um, also way of looking at what is the best way to restore a site or what is the best way to kind of like dig the site out and. Um, and throughout the process, there are so many kind of like, uh, there were a lot of conversation with a lot of different archeologists. So every person would kind of like have a different uh, viewpoint. Um, and this is where like, I was kind of trying to kind of understand what is, um, and there's, there's a lot of subjectivity of like everyone's uh, kind of, you know, way of looking at uh, the process and looking at um, how they're doing it uh, the best way. Um, I think because you mentioned that even the act of exposing is an act that causes it to suddenly become um, fragile and, and um, it's, it's then um, becomes um, in a different kind of material context where its rate of um, change accelerates all of a sudden. So um, I guess also not doing anything is an option. Exactly, exactly. But that's the thing that it was very interesting, like when, when, like when I was talking to the archaeologists, like a lot of conversation were like, yeah, we will be leaving a lot of like um, undigged sites, but then uh, there are other like, like if we want to kind of record them or like kind of understand like what, what went through this specific site, we will need to dig and we will need to kind of expose some layers. So it's literally like it becomes more of like what, what is more important or um like at that at that particular moment um and is it better to kind of like leave maybe part of the site uncovered and then the other part is kind of like let's say um uh, exposed um and it, it becomes more of also the responsibility of the archaeologists like what um, what percentage can be revealed and they can actually know more of uh, let's say the uh, the people who used to actually like um, uh, who used to settle there or like who used to actually travel in between and then they found those artifacts in that areas um, in those like areas around so it's literally a kind of this moment of on ground finding the best uh, time or kind of like um, let's say a moment to kind of expose or just let go of, um, of certain like uh, sites or specific like locations within the site itself so um, I really find this as well very interesting because like it's really kind of the it's it's kind of the archaeologist that is on ground that kind of like trying to make those decisions um, as you go in order to kind of understand what can be communicated or, mm. or kind of revealed uh, from the, from that particular site.
Um, another project, I mean, like, uh, which was uh, basically, uh, I was interested in, uh, I, there's a lot of impermanence in the work. So that's why like a lot of like the title was kind of like, uh, it's brought back, but in different way. Um, so this work was actually done based on like, um, uh, the fountains that are found in the Syrian courtyards um, in the old houses. And I was really interested in like how this structure resonates in a lot of people. And yet, even if, um, if someone did not grow up along or like witnessing those like kind of old typology of houses, um, they still remember or like they still kind of associate those, uh, those fountains uh, with like um, uh, Syrian houses. And what I find it really interesting, like it's a very separate uh, system and uh, where like it, it kind of like went through a lot of also um, uh, phases um, where it used to be like very functional and it was very important in the household because of the water system and the distribution of water system and uh, the cooling system of the house itself. And then it started to kind of like transform from it being functional to it being uh, decorative and just uh, kind of like a very interesting uh, place or a structure that people gather around. Um, and it becomes as well like a sound installation because of the typology of how like the old typologies of the houses, the courtyard houses, uh, it becomes as well a sound installation where people, the neighbor, the neighboring like will not actually hear uh, because of the water uh, system and that's where I find it very interesting, like how do we actually like relate or connect back to those structures? And um, where I started kind of looking at the typologies that are found uh, mostly on the Syrian courtyards and started to kind of create um, fragments of those kind of like structures. And how do we relate to fragments rather than uh, like relating back to a full, uh, a full experience or a full central uh, piece uh, that is usually found in the center of the courtyard. Usually like the, the fountains are like um, a circular or more kind of like a very geometric form that is in the center of the house. But what I was kind of interested in kind of taking is uh, the fragments that are within, uh, that are actually making up this, uh, uh, this piece, the, uh, the fountain itself. And during this process, I was interviewing as well a lot of like people who grew up um, around uh, fountains or around courtyard typologies and what does it uh, mean to them uh, this kind of structure and this is where like I started kind of dividing them or kind of making them uh, in quarters so it's not anymore a central space or a central structure within a central space but it's more of like fragments of these quarters that are spread in the space and we are becoming part of like basically this water uh, cir uh, circulation and water system. Um, so it's not anymore a kind of like an isolated system by itself where we always like see the water hidden in, in way where the, the pipe system or like how it actually serves the other houses or the other rooms around it. But it's more of the water is kind of like revealed in quarters. And this is where like every kind of like uh, shape has a very different kind of like uh, uh, sound as well of how the, the water and the nozzle works with the surface of the fountain itself. Um, and it was kind of an interesting experiment because like where it was an installation and it was kind of like spread apart and people were actually moving around them and um, and it kind of like, it, it kind of like created their own personality where like every kind of like fountain has its own personality of like how the water is kind of integrated within this type, this specific form. Um, yeah. Um, I mean, I'm going through like a lot of projects, I guess, but. Uh, uh, well, I think it's, it's great to see and understand and um, see the different themes that come through and also I think um, for me there's a lot of architectural and urban kind of inquiry in your work as well and so it's interesting to understand those kind of methods of 
surveying, um, you know, houses and courtyards and types and interviewing people as well as part of your process. And I think that we've talked a couple of times before. So I understand now that this is something that you do in, in many pro projects that you um, surround them with a, a, a big context, a city kind of context of people and buildings. Yeah, I, I mean, like, which was also very interesting, like in, um, like during the, the process of the fountain and the, the courtyards, because I was not so familiar with all the typology. So it's literally like about kind of the research that to try to understand like what are those like repetitive types um, of a courtyard and also the fountains that are kept on appearing as well in a lot of like courtyards, but in different forms and different kind of like uh, geometry configuration. And it was interesting because it depends on the scale of like the fountains to the courtyard space as well. Um, they start to kind of like appear and uh, it depends on like how many members are within that a courtyard and within the house, but also the, the stories that kind of like, so I, I did an interview uh, for like, and a lot of people were like from different kind of backgrounds and different um, like uh, with like people who grew up around fountains, but also they have like different kind of understanding of like from their point of view as an artist or as archeologist or as, um, um, as a, as like a chef as well, or like, I was kind of like trying to understand like, what, what does it actually mean to them or what it used to mean to them? And then how do they relate it as well to their practice? So I felt it was kind of like, I don't know, a project where we're reconnecting over a structure. And, um, and that's where like, I felt there's so much kind of like um, information that started to kind of like appear or like, uh, like with why do we have this kind of like um, connection to such a structure but um, and this is where like it felt it felt really kind of um, like I was really curious to understand like how different um, how other people would view that and um, kind of finding the reasons behind why do we always kind of relate it back to uh, to certain region or um, yeah what does it mean to actually have this connection with a structure that went through a lot of also transformation um, through time. And it's not anymore there, like it's just a symbolic. Right. I, I mean, that I know you're going to get to your accretions project, but I, I see a lot of um, similarities in the process and the discussion of um, an object, but that it's revealing a lot of um, different questions about the landscape and environment that that object is sitting in or part of. Yeah, yeah, I feel, yeah, like, this is like, um, yeah, this is, this is interesting, like, uh, where it's kind of like, there are different materials, or different processes, but then like, it's within the same kind of like method of like, investigating like the, uh, the work, uh, the, also who's involved in it, or the collaborator as well. Um, and the questions that like, kind of like, um, reconfigured or like re-questioned again based on like the, the type of project or the type of like the landscape is actually um, uh, questioned at that at that particular time. Um, yeah, I mean, this is also another project where uh, it's it's called Extractions and it was also ba basically uh, in Sharjah. There's a lot of um, um, a lot of kind of like references to uh, Islamic architecture. But, um, but the thing is like, uh, also if we want to define what is like Islamic architecture, it's actually something that is not, we really can't define it or label it because um, it's more about like, it, it, it existed away from all these ornamentation and it was literally about the geometric forms. But um, what was interesting to see like the uniformity that, uh, that happens within a city, when you enter it, you immediately kind of like, label it or like have a certain kind of like um let's say um a, like an idea of because of the architecture it holds uh, there is a lot of like repetition of ornamentation that is heavily used in a lot of buildings and references to other architecture periods and um, this is where i felt um does it actually relate to the city or what is the architecture of the city itself and this is where like um, i started to kind of like creating um uh, objects that are kind of like positioned 
across those buildings and uh, extracting uh, certain like kind of forms and um, from uh, and scaling them up basically and and creating um, like basically between them a water elements that combine them together and this is where because the the shift that happens in Sharjah previously it was a very simple architecture and in the region in general but then at a certain point it started to kind of like um, to pick up a lot of ornamentation from other regions as well and it started to have its own aesthetics and this is where like it was interesting to see the identity how it changed um, and how do you kind of like reconnect or we kind of like question the identity again of uh, of something that is always changing and let's say it has a lot of other references and uh, of other things but then when it becomes kind of like um, combined together or like applied again in a different context how does it actually um, reveal itself or what is this identity is kind of like you know the question of like are they creating, is it kind of like recreating something completely new that is very specific to, to Sharjah or it still has these references to other architecture types that are found in Egypt or in, in Turkey or other kind of places um, in the Middle East. So it was very interesting to find and to question that kind of like uh, how the architects started to kind of like see those patterns and it's literally repeated in a lot of buildings. So it's not only one building or one type but you start noticing them um, all along uh, one city. So it was very interesting to see like there is a uniformity, but it's not also um, uh, shown or um, uh, let's say like written um, through like, let's say a regulation book or, uh, or there was something that is very kind of specific like for the architects to use, uh, but it was literally very open where people started to kind of like architects started to kind of like because of the because of let's say there are certain typologies were already executed in the city so they started to pick up the same style and build through that style and i find it interesting because it's not about like it's more about like what they find in the context itself and they start to pick up and um work along and and that's why like when the soonest you kind of like um, enter Sharjah or like it's really very different from the rest of the Emirates because um, it started to have a very uniform type of architecture and that's where like I was really interested to kind of like recreate those kind of like elements away from the architecture side but more for us to kind of experience those um, and question their, their origin. Um, yeah. So this is where it was actually like there were three types and the three types were facing uh, three different uh, buildings uh, that has different kind of like um, fragments of different kind of like um, um, basically geometric forms that that were used in the in the building repeatedly, um, and it was an, a public installation uh, in in a in a garden space. So now we're moving to accretions and accumulation, which is like the earlier research of, uh, of accretions. Um, so literally kind of following the same kind of method of uh, questioning a certain landscape, questioning how, how people as well interact with this landscape or the tools that it has been used around. Um, what, is the, what is this connection between, um, between people, between the nature, between also like other authorities that are regulating certain landscapes and certain contexts. And this is where I started to kind of like work with fishermen and uh, kind of look at the tools they are using, um, uh, the language, the typologies are like the, the growth that is happening and they are facing in, in, their, in their kind of like fishing, uh, fishing practice. And um, I was really interested in uh, the nets and like how uh, those nets kind of like uh, take a very specific form and uh, they're also kind of like um, used across all the almost like all the fishermen um, and uh, I'm, I was literally interested in the process of the fishing and how they actually respond to a such big bound like there is no way to kind of like uh, restrict or like understand the motion of um, what happens like in, in the sea itself and 
because there's a lot of kind of like um, changes, transformation, and it's always kind of like changing and moving. And it's literally becoming more of the day that matters or the hours and like if they will be able to actually go and uh, do their like fishing or not uh, based on the other factors that is kind of more prominent than anything else because um, it's unpredictable. And uh, this is where I find it really interesting to see like how fishermen kind of like in, in daily basis interact with, with, with the landscape with their very simple tools and simple method of kind of um, uh, fishing. Um, and in the first phase of uh, accretions, I was really interested to understand uh, basically the tools, um, how they get reshaped, adjusted based on uh, the need and based on like what would make kind of like uh, kind of more, more sense to the fishermen and to, to, uh, to the people who are living from, from, this, um, uh, from this practice. And then like, how does it work as well when we're looking at the ecology and like the kind of the, uh, the ocean uh, as a whole. Um, so it was very interesting for me where um, I was literally kind of going with, with the fishermen in their, in, their, in their trips to understand that more, to understand uh, what they go through, um, what are, like, how do they actually kind of readjust um, based on, let's say, the things that they actually found in their, uh, in their trip, um, and how do they actually regulate the fishing in between themselves, because there's a lot of, like, there's always, like, a regulation that happens in one side, but then um, on ground, there's always, like, a lot of other things that started to kind of appear and show, um, and they start to face uh, and to kind of like interact with. And I find it, I find that uh, very interesting. Um, and along with that, there is also like um, scientific kind of understanding of the accumulation, the growth that happens. And this is where we're trying to kind of get some samples to understand the growth uh, that accumulates and deposits on those, um, on those structures and nets. Um, and it was mm -hmm. interesting. So the fishermen make these shapes, don't they? Exactly. Yes. And it, and it's it made. What material are they made from? Um, so initially, they used to make uh, made them like by uh, using the pound fronds before, but then through time, it got changed uh, into uh, wire, uh, wire metal wires, and um, and they were very. I mean, like they are really very kind of thin wires and then they shape them in a very specific way in order to create like um, uh, kind of a very integrated and intricate kind of like pattern that will not be able to kind of like uh, it, it, it's really not that loose like it becomes very stiff in the structure itself and the reason as well because it's it's has a form how do they how did they make it on top of a shape or how do they make it in these shapes so basically they sit inside of one of them, like literally on the opposite side, like they, they turn it and then they start kind of weaving all along in a circular manner. Uh, and it's, it's really nice because like they, um, what they were actually, like why the shape took that a specific dome structure. And it's just to kind of like uh, mimicking basically uh, the coral shapes. Um, but I mean, there is no any kind of connection. And, but this is what I find it very interesting. Like, uh, they just wanted something that is kind of more works and for them there is a lot of fascination as well like for those like uh, marine structures and I mean like the marine organisms so that's where like uh, they were recreating certain elements or certain tools mimicking the shapes of certain organisms and um, but it's very interesting to see like how they are trying to mimic that uh, through a, like a wire, uh, wire weaving. Um, and like the knowledge of kind of like understanding like this would actually attract more like fish and it would be kind of like the best for, uh, the best thing to use for them uh, was very, very interesting to see. Yeah, so those are like some of, um, the photos that was actually taken in one of the trips um, and usually they um, they always kind of like clean off uh, those accumulations or like the growth that happens on top of the, these nets because they want to maintain 
uh, maintain kind of the, um, the mesh itself. Uh, but what I was really interested in is to kind of like uh, lead, like leading the growth and to understand more like the, uh, the growth pattern and how much like pattern kind of, or let's say density that can actually be accumulated. And, um, and that's where like uh, the accretion was all about kind of understanding um, the time, uh, how do we anchor into a space that is always moving and changing um, over time? How do we kind of also like understand the growth pattern? What are those organisms that uh, keep on kind of like um, growing and attaching to certain like elements and uh, creating those structures that are basically um, uh, calcium carbonate that are kind of like cleft colonies in certain areas and then they kind of like migrates to another surfaces. So those kind of like the, the left structures or the, um, the, the calcified structures, how does it actually work um, and get kind of like over time and over structures and over other constraints. Um, and it was very interesting to kind of like also question that with like the knowledge of uh, the, uh, the marine biologists and also the, the knowledge with uh, the fishermen who are on grounds. So it was always kind of this comparison that happened where we are taking some samples to understand what they were and what those arg organisms are um, and what also the fishermen has uh, named them. So it, it's like, it was very interesting to see how uh, fishermen has a very specific like names and uh, that are re in reference to their, their look, their texture, their, their color while a scientific, um, uh, let's say, naming and labeling was completely different, where it's more about, um, about like the, the cells, uh, the cells and other factors that is not actually obvious, like um, in in their kind of like very simple simple manner. But it's really interesting to see how fishermen kind of uh, started to label all these organisms and those structures and when they face and in a very simple way, similar to the tools they have been using as well. And, um, and also like scientifically how it was also named uh, so differently. Um, and you mentioned also that you would sometimes ask scientists what, what these things were and they didn't really know. It, it's quite, there's quite a sort of, there's a bit of mystery about these tiny, tiny things that are in the ocean somehow. And maybe there's a sort of a, a more exact knowledge in some ways from the fishermen who are, are encountering them every day. Exactly, yeah. I mean, this is also very interesting because the, the, the scientists, um, there was always kind of like uncertainty of things or uncertainty of the growth pattern as well where based on like, let's say earlier research, but there's no any kind of definite answer of what it is, but, um, but there was always like, oh, it may be, it might be this, or it might be that, uh, or it might grow in that particular way based on like the research that has been done before. But then the fishermen like immediately, it's like the answers were so kind of like, yeah, we know what, what this is. And, you know, like it was very interesting to see like how uh, like on grounds and like how fishermen were so in control or like in a way like in control of certain like you know things they know every day because they face those like um, they face and they actually interact with those kind of organisms structures uh, the growth and they notice these in, in daily basis and uh, that was interesting to kind of like keep referring back to you know a lot of other disciplines and this is where, where I mean it's interesting because um, every discipline kind of like um, every particular person look at certain things differently but then uh, there's so different kind of like way of understanding it or digging more to understand like what it is and I find like um, the knowledge on grounds is always kind of interesting to see how they react to these things because um, yeah it's just like interesting as well to see those behaviors happening you know uh where i was literally in in the middle like just understanding like okay what do i do now like how do i communicate you know certain like you know the uh, like for example when we were taking like a lot of samples from uh one of the structures of accretions and trying to understand what they were um 
the fishermen like really wanted to understand like scientifically what does that mean but we could not get into an answer so we just like kept on like going back and referring back to what the fisherman uh, is using rather than like what scientifically it's actually named after uh, so yeah i mean like this was one of the very interesting points that happened during the the research um, yeah this is just like a close-up um, of of accretion but i feel like this is something that there are really kind of like infinite ways of looking at uh, at the processes and then how do we come come back again because within like um, the research was very kind of interesting because there is so many factors um, to look back um, and to kind of like go back to the process again and dig more and uh, understand the, the very kind of like specific elements that happen during this process and rebringing them back again whether along this this project or uh, a future project uh, but it's really about the collaboration or like kind of the uh, the questions that kind of like raised within different disciplines along certain like landscape or certain kind of structure um, so with this project with the process um, obviously these are not the nets from the fishermen is that right exactly yes so the, the fishing basically on the accretions, like when uh, I started just to kind of understand uh, the process, I started using first the fisherman tools just to start uh, understanding like what we will be, I mean, what we are experimenting with, also like the lost nets that were in the ocean, just to understand like how much they've been lost. And we can tell that through how much like accumulation has been through those surfaces. So it was all about kind of understanding first um, the growth pattern uh, with the fishermen, but then later um, there are a lot of also like because of uh, uh, the kind of uh, the forces or like how the the, the lost meshes started to kind of like uh, deform uh, through time and through other forces. So I started kind of like recreating those uh, deformed structures uh, using a, a new structure made of metal and then uh, using the same kind of like um, weaving method but uh, in, in, in a bit different way but maintaining the same pattern um, and that's where like it was in, in accretions it was more of a surface um, a surface application let's say or a surface like form rather than let's say a whole volume uh, uh, vol uh, volumetric kind of like uh, structure where the fishermen were using them as like a trap system um but yeah that's where like the, the change of, uh, of form happens and how long how long were, were these in the water for so some of them were actually for uh, like three months to uh six months mm -hmm. uh, and this is where like it was in between the period of kind of uh between summer and winter to understand like where um, when things get kind of like changed or moved from one surface to another uh, and how, like by losing uh, some nutrients, how uh, the, the migration of organisms happened as well. Uh, and this is where like, we were kind of looking at different locations that would have um, less impact or less kind of like on uh, marine organisms, but mainly kind of trying to, um, to kind of like um, understand like, how do we actually position these in a way where it will not have uh, a huge impact as well um, on, on the growth. Mm -hmm. There's something, I mean, in your first project that you showed where you were casting on site in different locations and there was a lot of changes and unpredictability that was happening from that interaction. And in this one, you're also making not a mold, but a kind of infrastructure for things to happen to. Um, and, and so I guess in both of them, there's an element of input in the beginning, but um, the acceptance of a whole lot of, um, as you said, collaboration with materials or natural things. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I, yeah, this is exactly, I mean, like, it's interesting, like this, the idea of like, how do we interact and how, when do we actually let go of things and then um, kind of accept um, the results and what's what's going to happen and this is where I find this kind of like the leaving um, 
like a, a content like for the material to kind of like exist and um and kind of reveal other properties within this process um this is what what kind of like maybe even question more things as we go uh, during the process itself because of the unexpected kind of like results or the unexpected factors that start to kind of like grow within this process um for sure yeah um I, when i mean i think i've mentioned to you before as well about if you've ever mapped all your projects because one thing listening to you present your work is that um i'm i'm trying to picture the relationship between all these projects because all of them describe a particular place so and there was the mountains with the shards and the the courtyards with the water and the archaeological um places and the desert and the beach and the ocean and um so there's a very rich kind of um sense of of the place that you're making all of these things that you're communicating when you're describing all of these process and um and they seem all connected as well so i would love to see to understand how they all fit together um geographically and, and also to the natural systems because i guess there's a a sense of of sand and i mean that must connect all of these projects in some way yeah i mean like i think it is very connected to the context and um and because like i think growing growing up in the uae there's a lot of shifts and changes that happens to those landscapes as well and i think that's why like there is a lot of questioning of um of the temporality of things as well like um certain landscape will just disappear because there's other things that are coming along that area specifically or there are certain things that are rechanging and we re re kind of like configured in terms of like um a, a new regulation or a new system or a new kind of like way of looking at certain um uh, spaces and um and because i grew up like in different locations i mean like uh, in in Fujairah first which is the mountain side and then i moved to Sharjah which is more the ocean side so i feel like there's a lot of also connection and understanding or of um the locations you're around and in a way like there's a lot of this kind of um i don't know there's really kind of interest on on these materials because of how how fast things are changing within them in the in the like um, the micro scale of things but then also in the macro scale if we're looking at um, the context in general it's also very fast moving and changing all the time and um you mean think, mostly human change or, or natural change also actually both like um both of them because like in a way there's always like it's constant changing naturally um and you see it more more like recent than before and um and then also like um the human impact on certain things as well or like how do we actually work or like how do we exist within certain like contexts or uh, certain landscapes um and that's where i feel like there is always like they're always like changing and that's where i feel like i really want to kind of understand more um like the the specific the like the specific kind of like that made up this whole landscape but also like by kind of zooming out and understand like how this kind of landscape fits within uh, the whole city or the whole like um, yeah the whole city basically um yeah that's very that's very fascinating um i think i think we've reached our time limit and i feel like this is a nice place to to end because i think that scale from the micro to to the city or the landscape or the the country i think it's it's very much embodied in in all your work um so um thank you for sharing your beautiful work with us and it was very fascinating to speak with you not just today but the other times that we've spoken as well um and i look forward to doing it again sometime in the future